So welcome everybody. I'm Monica Toft. I'm a professor at the Fletcher School of uh, Law and Diplomacy. And more importantly, I'm the chair of the International Security Se Studies section for the International Studies Association. And I'm going to be moderating this panel today, which is looking at Afghanistan and US national security policy. Uh, before we get to the panel, I do want to mention the passing of John Ruggie, uh, who was uh, you know, sort of a very esteemed, highly accomplished scho scholar in the field, and he passed away last week. So I give my thoughts to his wife, Mary, and uh, he will be missed. Uh, so the panel today, we are going to be discussing Afghanistan and U.S. national security policy, and we're two weeks in since the departure of U.S. forces, and I think we can all agree that the evacuation did not go uh, as well as it might have been. And so this, this and, and then the fact that we had to evacuate after two decades um, of conflict and occupation in the country. And so this panel was set up to address how the U.S. defense uh, establishment got into this 20 year war and the occupation and the implications of the intervention for US national security policy. I should mention this is the first in a series of panels to be hosted by this section. Uh, two others will follow in coming weeks. So how we plan to proceed is that each panelist will present for about 10 minutes. I may ask a follow up question or two if I'm curious or if I'm left in the dark about something. And then we're going to turn to uh, questions from you, the attendees, uh, and we plan to end promptly at 1 p.m. Uh, the question and answer uh, list is open, so please direct your questions there. I have a lot to monitor, so hopefully I can get to most of them. Uh, if I don't get to your question, I apologize. Um, and as you can see uh, by the panelists, it's an excellent panel uh, with different areas of expertise when it comes to US national security policy, high, high level scholarship, and then of course experience um, um, consulting with the policy community. Um, so we're gonna go in alphabetical order. And so we're gonna start with Audrey Kurt Cronin, who is the Distinguished Pre Professor of International Service and director, and actually the founding director of the Center for Sh Security, Innovation, and New Technology at American University. Then we'll go to Jacqueline Jill Hazelton, uh, who we need to congratulate. Congratulations, Jill, that you're newly tenured associate professor in the Department of Strategy and Policy at the US Naval War College, terrific. Um, and then we're gonna end with John Mearsheimer, who is the R. Wendell Harrison Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. As I mentioned, this is a distinguished panel uh, with lots of experience thinking about these issues about the US defense establishment and US policy. Uh, so Audrey, I'm gonna give you the floor. Thank you so much, Monica. I'm honored to be here, and I greatly appreciate the opportunity to have this interaction with my fellow panelists and also with this esteemed audience. So quickly, um, in my 10 minutes, a brief background on uh, my work. It's always been on the general topic of how conflicts end. I started studying Afghanistan in 1987, and I was working on how to build a regional, regional peace agreement there. Uh, throughout the 90s, I followed the Mujahideen, and that's actually how I got into the study of counterterrorism through Afghanistan. On 9-11, I was teaching at Georgetown University. One of my students rescued people from the Pentagon and was badly burned on his hands. My college classmates, several of them were killed when Tower One of the World Trade Center fell. And my neighbor, three doors down from our house, was on Flight 77 when it crashed into the Pentagon. So I just wanna open up by reminding everyone that on September 11th, we were scared in the United States. And yes, I believe the United States overreacted in the years that followed. Gradually, the United States began to pursue objectives that were ill-defined and open-ended. So now two broad points. The first on shifting US objectives. Our objectives in Afghanistan kept shifting. They were not the same from the beginning uh, as they became years later. To begin with, the goal was to prevent the Taliban and Al-Qaeda from attacking the United States again. There was no clear concept of victory other than to strike back at Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. Disrupting global networks uh, was the overriding concern. Operations started in October 2001. They targeted training camps, training camps and military assets. There were a small number of US Special Operations Forces and CIA paramilitary, but the main fighting force was the Northern Alliance and they were supported by considerable air support from the United States. When the Taliban began to resurge in late 2005, then President Bush changed the mission to what some called nation building. And he touted a free press, schools for girls, the establishment of democracy in Afghanistan, and that was a huge expansion of our initial objectives. 
Then President Obama surged troops to Afghanistan in February of 2009. And at this point, there were about 68,000 US and NATO troops, and he increased them by 17,000 more. There was also a dramatic escalation in US drone strikes during 2009. Then in 2014, Obama declared the end of combat operations, reduced US presence to 13,000 troops. And in 2017, Trump increased that by 3,000, but then he signed the Doha agreement, which did not include the Afghan uh, government in February of 2020. And uh, he agreed to withdraw all US troops. Biden completed that withdrawal of the last 2,500 uniformed US troops last month. And that final withdrawal was, as Monica has already referred to, calamitous. So then my final point about regional diplomacy in Afghanistan. I started arguing for the withdrawal of, uh, of US troops from Afghanistan in 2009. After that, both in print and in meetings with Afghan leaders and US policymakers, I was trying very hard to persuade them that a negotiated regional agreement on neutrality was the way forward. That was the agreement that would have included the regional neighbors, those who had previously and currently support factions within Afghanistan, uh, including Pakistan, Iran, India, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States, and then to be joined by China. You might remember that starting in 2009, US diplomat Richard Holbrook had tried to build a foundation for a broader regional peace approach, but he died suddenly in 2010. And from that point on, US military and intelligence missions in Afghanistan eclipsed any other kind of regional diplomatic approach. Many Afghan leaders though were very keenly interested in neutrality for their country and they strongly supported the idea of a regional agreement. The Tobin project sponsored my additional research on that topic and I presented uh, papers on neutrality and neutralization in, um, of Afghanistan to small gatherings in both Boston and Washington DC and they captured quite a bit of interest. Career diplomat uh, Afghan uh, Nasir Andisha attended one of those talks and in 2015 he, spoke, he wrote a special report for the Institute of Peace that was all about advocating for neutrality for his own country. He was Afghanistan's deputy foreign minister from 2015 to 2019, and Ambassador Andisha continued to argue for neutrality and a neutralization broad regional agreement throughout the summer until he lost his position just last month when the Taliban took over in Afghanistan. So to wrap up, the United States entered Afghanistan in direct response to the, US, to the attacks on 9-11 upon the US homeland. And that was a legitimate, I believe, a legitimate response to those attacks specifically. The Bush administration never intended to occupy the country indefinitely, but then it greatly expanded its mission, melded it into a kind of an open-ended campaign that came to be known as the global war on terror. And that was a mistake. Now, as was the case when I started doing this work on Afghanistan more than 30 years ago, I still believe that a negotiated regional neutrality agreement for Afghanistan is the best solution for the country's future peace and stability. Thank you, Audrey, that's terrific. Um, so Jill. Thank you so much. I'm glad to be here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. I also have to say starting out that these are my own views and not those of any government entity. One of the many tragedies of the US and partner war in Afghanistan is that the great powers intervening in that civil war ever thought they could fundamentally change Afghan governance, politics and society. Even with the unmatched military power of the United States and its partners, history shows that they have little likelihood of making structural good governance reforms to defeat the Taliban insurgency. There's a myth in the West that great powers bring democratizing reforms to threaten governments and thus defeat insurgencies. This is a myth that has driven US involvement in other states' internal conflicts since the end of the Cold War including Vietnam and more recently Iraq, as well as Afghanistan. But analysis of the historical record shows that when a great power intervenes in support of a threatened partner, believing that reforms are the solution, the great power not only doesn't get reforms, it actually supports further repression and uses of force against civilians. 
in my new book, Bullets Not Ballots, Success in Counterinsurgency Warfare, I look at the five counterinsurgency campaigns most often cited as successful examples of great power, liberal military intervention. Supporters of this type of intervention, they claim that these five cases, the Malayan emergency, the Greek civil war, the Philippines war on the hawk, the Salvadoran civil war, and the conflict in Dofar, Oman, supporters claim that in these cases, a great power intervener, whether it was the United Kingdom or the United States, helped the government make reforms, gain popular support, and thus defeat the insurgency. In fact, instead of reforms, all of these counterinsurgent governments succeeded in staying in power in far uglier ways. They attacked insurgents directly to break their will to fight, they accommodated the personal and political interests of individual elites to gain their support, and they used the military to tightly control civilians. None of the governments gained significant popular support. In Malaya, for example, between 1948 and 1957, the British forced some um, half a million people into new villages. Uh, it's a pretty name for prison camps where the British rationed food and frequently searched the inhabitants for contraband. In Dofar in the 1960s and 70s, the British led military tightly controlled civilian communities, destroyed civilian food crops and livestock, and poisoned community wells. The Salvadoran military used US supplied air power to attack civilian communities. Successful counterinsurgency campaigns have high human and ethical costs, and they're rarely worth what the great power that's intervening expects to get out of it because these, these costs are so high. The Western narrative about bringing enlightened rule to the people is simply unfounded. Now, the question is what to do about Afghanistan since the West has withdrawn its military forces. There is a deepening humanitarian emergency as we speak. There is a drought, there is a lack of food, medical care and fuel, and there is continued political violence. At this time, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund and the European Union have frozen funding for their projects and the United States has frozen $7 billion in Afghan foreign reserves. These states and international institutions are holding back money because they want to have some leverage over the Taliban in order to try and ensure respect for human and civil rights. But there is an immediate question about whether it is more ethical to support trying to reduce human suffering in Afghanistan now or to keep aid frozen in order to hopefully shape Taliban behavior in the longer run. It was international relations working with international organizations, I'm sorry, working with Afghans that changed individual lives in Afghanistan during the last 20 years. They supported and staffed health clinics, refuges from domestic violence and schools, among other things. I would argue that the optimum choice now is to restore aid to Afghanistan to reduce the suffering as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, John? Thank you uh, very much, Monica, for organizing this panel and inviting me. And I'm glad to be here with Jill and Audrey, both of whom I have known for a long time and have great respect for. Uh, I want to make two points about Afghanistan. One is that we were doomed from the get go. We never stood a chance. Uh, and second, getting out. Uh, is a net positive. And if we had been really smart, which we of course have not been in the post-Cold War period, we would have gotten out a long time ago. Now, why do I say we were doomed? Let me start by saying, I actually think once the Taliban refused to turn over Osama bin Laden to us, we had no choice but to go in. Uh, you can make a strategic argument for not going in, but politically, there was no way we could avoid going in. Uh, and once you go in, you have to do extensive state building, whether you do it immediately or you delay it a few years, it's inevitable. 
And the reason is that there are hardly any meaningful state institutions in this country. So you've got to create institutions. Uh, and furthermore, you have to create a formidable army. And I'll talk more about this in a minute. You need a formidable army because the Taliban is eventually going to come back from the dead. You've not decisively defeated them. So you need an Afghani army that's part of that Afghani state that can deal with the Taliban. And furthermore, you have to do state building because the man that you put in charge in Kabul is basically a puppet. And it's not like you had this ready-made opposition that had been waging a civil war and was well-organized and could take over the country, right? Uh, so there was an imperative to do a great deal of work. Uh, and especially if you're interested in turning it into some sort of quasi-liberal democracy, which is uh, what we wanted to do. Now, my argument is this was just never going to work. Uh, first of all, and Jill was alluding to this, if you look at the literature on foreign imposed regime change, uh, especially when you're talking about turning countries into a democracy, it's quite clear from the historical record that it hardly ever works period, end of story. And then there's Afghanistan. Let's talk a little bit about Afghanistan. The first major problem that you run into in Afghanistan is that although you defeated the Taliban, you did not decisively defeat the Taliban. You did not knock them out once and for all. They're gonna come back from the dead at some point. And on top of that, they have a sanctuary in Pakistan which causes you enormous problems, as we learned with regard to Cambodia and Laos during the Vietnam War. And furthermore, it's not just a sanctuary, there's all sorts of evidence that the Pakistani government is gonna help the Taliban, which really complicates the problem. Furthermore, what happens is we become an occupier and we are joined at the hip with the government in Kabul. And as was the case in Vietnam, where we became an occupier and were joined at the hip with the government in Saigon, this has disastrous consequences. First of all, you delegitimize the government because the government exists in good part because of an occupier, an outside force. And in the age of nationalism, that's a source of big trouble almost every time. Furthermore, you get widespread corruption Right? And you get widespread corruption because anytime Uncle Sam comes in to deal with the problem, Sam throws huge amounts of money at the problem, and huge amounts of money mean corruption. Furthermore, and again, this happened in Vietnam, you get corruption inside the U.S. national security establishment, including the U.S. military, including the U.S. Army. Right? So you have high levels of corruption in the fighting forces of Afghanistan, Right? You have a government that doesn't have a lot of legitimacy. And then finally, and very importantly, it's an incompetent fighting force. Why is it incompetent? Because it has no real incentive to become competent. Because every time it gets into trouble, it can turn to Uncle Sam and ask Uncle Sam to pull its chestnuts out of the fire. Again, the same pattern we saw in Vietnam. So it's hardly surprising that a fighting force of 350,000 was defeated by a fighting force of 75,000. That fighting force of 350,000 was incompetent, corrupt, and fighting for a government that didn't have a whole heck of a lot of legitimacy. And the final point I'll make on this has to do with Iraq. If you're gonna go into Afghanistan and you're not gonna defeat the Taliban and you're gonna do nation building in that country or state building in that country, it is gonna be one well of a difficult task. And to prove John is wrong, that we were doomed from the start, you're going to have to keep your eye on the ball. And we foolishly took our eye off the ball almost immediately after toppling the Taliban. By early 2002, we're talking about going into Iraq. And Iraq becomes the numero uno scenario for Uncle Sam for at least the next five or six years. And when you take your eye off the ball in Afghanistan, that makes it even more difficult to prevail or to accomplish your goal of building a viable state. Now, after 20 years, what do we have to show? We spent 85 plus billion dollars arming and training the Afghani forces. 
approximately 775,000 American troops cycled through Afghanistan. Uh, the war is estimated to eventually cost us $2.1 trillion. Uh, we lost uh, a huge number of American soldiers and even more contractors. And what do we have to show for it? Nothing. There's nobody who's arguing that we should not get out of Afghanistan over the past year because we've finally found the magic formula. Nobody's arguing that. We have the way of winning in Afghanistan. Nobody's come up with a plausible strategy of victory. So what's the argument for staying? The argument for staying is that the consequences will be horrendous if we leave, and therefore we have to stay. This brings me to the second part of my talk. I think, as I said early on, the consequences are a net positive. First of all, you hear this argument that this is a devastating defeat because it shifts the balance of power against us. This defeat, and by the way, it was a humiliating defeat. We have egg all over our face. I don't deny that, but that's not an important strategic consequence. To argue that we have lost power and that the strategic or global balance of power has shifted against us would be an important consequence. But this has no effect on the global balance of power, which is largely a result of the state of your economy and your military forces. So it doesn't shift the global balance of power at all. With regard to the war on terrorism, first of all, I don't think the Taliban is going to tolerate Al-Qaeda uh, launching attacks against the United States. I think they have been there, done that. They know what the consequences are, and we've made it clear to them that they better not do that. But even if I'm wrong and they do that, I don't think it's going to make the United States more vulnerable in any meaningful way. We've basically dealt with the terrorism problem by building layered defenses, and we're in excellent shape on that front. You're more likely to die slipping in your bathtub than to be killed by somebody from Al Qaeda. We've got that problem under control, regardless of what happens in Afghanistan. Then other people say, oh, this is a huge defeat because we're retreating. The United States is isolationist. It's coming home. This is ridiculous. The United States is focusing now, refocusing on Asia, which it should have been focusing on a long time ago. There is a real threat out there. It's called China, not some amorphous concept of terrorism, right? We have to deal with China. That's what really matters. And there's no evidence we're retreating there. And indeed, if anything, this will allow us to free up resources especially intellectual resources, but as well as material resources to deal with what I think is the real threat, which is China and to deal with containing China. The final argument has to do with credibility. And this is the argument that American credibility is shot as a result of this. And the Chinese are gonna think we're wussies and they can do this and they can do that. The Taiwanese can't depend on us. The Japanese can't depend on us. First of all, I don't believe that that is true. I think that everybody in East Asia understands that East Asia really matters strategically for the United States. Afghanistan does not matter, but just in case, they're misunderstanding the situation. What's going to happen now is we are going to redouble our commitments to places like Taiwan, places like Japan, places like South Korea, places like Australia, because we want to make it perfectly clear to them that we are not retreating, that our credibility is as good as ever. So I think that the argument that this is a blow to our credibility or our reputation doesn't hold. Uh, any more than it held during the Cold War when we lost in Vietnam, had egg all over our face, and then concentrated on Europe instead of Southeast Asia. And by the way, we lost in Vietnam, and 14 years later, we won a stunning victory in the Cold War and emerged as the most powerful state in the history of the world. Uh, so I think what happened in Afghanistan just doesn't matter much. And of course, President Obama wanted to leave Afghanistan and couldn't. President Trump wanted to leave Afghanistan and couldn't. President Biden wanted to leave Afghanistan and he did leave. He's the third president who wanted out. 
because all three of them understood getting out was the smart thing to do. We couldn't win and the consequences were strategic consequences uh, were a net positive. The American people wanted out. The only people who didn't want out were people in the blob, the foreign policy establishment, uh, who would have preferred to stay forever. Had they been in charge after the Vietnam War in 1975, we'd still be in Vietnam. Thank you, Monica. Thanks, John. Thanks, Jill, and thanks, Audrey. So I'm just going to ask each one of you sort of a follow-up question. Um, so Audrey, I really appreciate you talking about sort of a policy action that should have been taken in 2009 that you're advocating about neutrality for Afghanistan uh, and, and sort of a regional sort of settlement, um, but it wasn't taken up, right? And so my question is, is what are some examples of that? So where did you sort of read and, and think about uh, that as a policy? Um, and what's changed that you think that this is still a possibility for Afghanistan? Right. Well, as a member of the blob, since I live in Washington, D.C., John, <laughs> actually, I have to say that the vast majority of the people that I know were in favor of withdrawal from Afghanistan. And so I don't think you can characterize the whole blob as wanting us to stay there. In fact, virtually everyone I know has been arguing that we need to withdraw from Afghanistan since about 2009. And the only question has always been exactly how to do it. So I agree with you that wanted to do so and have been unable to do so, partly because they couldn't figure out whether they could afford the kind of costs that Biden has uh, probably just paid politically with our domestic uh, context. So I think it's just a little bit more complicated than the blob being against it. But anyhow, um, fair enough. Now, on the question of neutrality and neutralization, I have gone back through history and looked at a lot of other examples of neutralization. Now, I don't want to give a kind of a boring history lesson because most of those examples come from, you know, classical periods of great power politics that are, I think, somewhat different from what we're facing today. But the parallels between the neutralization of Switzerland, the neutralization of Austria, the neutralization of Laos, for example, these things all have aspects that apply quite well to Afghanistan, particularly Switzerland. Uh, which was an extraordinarily fractious, uh, Canton-divided, extraordinarily martial society. Uh, you know, the Swiss like to think that they're, I, I, I am Swiss, by the way, of, of extraction, so I say this with great love, but um, the Swiss like to think that they've always been the peacemakers and the people who kind of build bridges between people, but they're also very well known for their ability to be martial warriors, just as the Afghans are. And the reason why the Swiss eventually stopped turning against each other and became a neutral country related to the fact that, that Napoleon was unable to, uh, to conquer the country. And uh, he, they just decided that it was better that this kind of extraordinarily geographically challenging place that was right at the heart of Europe and in some ways a crossroads of the world in a similar way that Afghanistan was, that it was really better for Switzerland to be a kind of a neutral crossing point and maintain its own neutrality and have it guaranteed by the regional powers around it. So it was better than each power trying to conquer it and constantly working with one faction or another against the other. So I understand all of the various uh, reasons why those two parallels uh, don't work fully. And I'd be happy to send anyone who's interested some of the many things I've written about it that have also been published in Washington Quarterly and in a number of books. And you know, I've been working on this for quite a long time. I understand the differences and I'm not able to go into all of those details, but Afghanistan is in some ways in terms of its geographical setting and in terms of the way that the regional powers are in interfering and have interfered for centuries, it is in some ways parallel to Switzerland. Um, and Jill, I just want to parse. So you're an expert on counterinsurgency and, and reading your book, you know, there's a lot about occupation. So I guess my question to you is, is it possible to have a counterinsurgency without having to worry about an occupation, right? So John sort of doesn't, I, I think this is right. John, you don't seem to think so in the case of Afghanistan. But Jill, I'm just wondering, you know, are there successful cases of counterinsurgency where you don't have to have that occupation, where you can get out? It's a really good question, and my answer may not go directly to your point, so please press back if you need to. In my book, I also look at the Turkey PKK campaign from 1985 to 1999 with the capture of Abdullah Allah, um, a child who was the head of the PKK. And that is 
generally acknowledged to be one of the more brutal counterinsurgency campaigns that we've seen in the late 20th century. I compared it to the five uh, US UK cases. And what I found was quite surprising is that these Western uh, liberal interventions actually look quite a bit like the Turkish case in their um, more unappealing aspects, the control of civilians, the, um, the payoffs and bribes to co-opt other elites to get their information and use their uh, military forces. So when you have um, a government that is primarily doing the fighting against its own insurgency with some outside backing and I have yet to find a counterinsurgency campaign that doesn't have some outside backing. When we look at Turkey, we see that what succeeds for the state itself is the same as what succeeds when there's an intervening liberal great power involved. Does that answer your question? Monica, you're on mute. Thank you. Um, you know, so I'm teaching my international security class, and of course, Afghanistan, we pretty much start with that, although the Milley thing was yesterday too, although next week is civil military relations. And I made the same point about, you know, strategically, it was a mistake to go in Afghanistan, but Bush politically really just didn't have a choice. So if you had been advising Bush, we've now got this 20 years of history, we had Vietnam, you know, what would you have advised him? What was the alternative um, so that we don't get entangled in these kinds of messes in the future. Is that me or John? That's for John. Okay. okay. I think there is no simple answer to that. Uh, I think the least bad alternative would have been to go in, uh, knocked off the Taliban as we did, and then gotten out in large part. But where does that leave you? The Taliban, as I said, is going to come back from the dead the Karzai government is not going to be able to defend itself. And I think probably you have to accept the fact that the Taliban will come back, will have lots of power in Afghanistan. And the best you can do is send them a message that if they do it again, you'll come back in. Uh, is that uh, a strategy that uh, warms the cockles of my heart? No. Uh, I think there's uh, really as I said, politically, no way to avoid going in. And even if you go in, it's very hard to get out quickly. Uh, so I, I, I think we were doomed in a very important way. And I'll just also say, Monica, you know, getting out in 2009 was the smart thing to do once we're in there and it's not working out very well. But as President Obama, President Trump, and President Biden felt found out, getting out was almost impossible. Uh, Audrey, you, you wanted to... Just a very quick point that I'd like to throw in there to the mix. Um, I don't think the Taliban have really won. I mean, they may have uh, power now, but they're not actually governing yet. And I also don't think that the Afghan National Force was defeated because what happened was they melted away and they were, it's a tribal country uh, the national government, the national force was built on a centralized model, and there were huge divisions within tribal divisions within that model. And so members of the national army just went along with what their tribe did, and they were cutting deals all over the place, which is exactly what the Afghans have done for hundreds of years. So I don't see it as a classic military struggle between, you know, Afghan National Army, Taliban, and Taliban one. I, I see it as far more complex, not least because the Taliban are more than just one thing. There's the Afghan Taliban, there's the Pakistani Taliban, there's the Haqqani network. You know, each of these have various different interests and we'll see who really won. Jill, did you want to say anything about this or? Let's move on to uh, questions from the audience then. I did have a thought, but I'm perfectly happy to hold it. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so we have quite a list of questions from the audience and I guess I'll start um, with the first one is from Asha Gupta. Um, and they ask if the war on terror was a mistake, an overreaction on the part of the USA, isn't leaving Afghanistan unguarded also a mistake? Um, 
So I'm wondering, you know, so the question is, is should we have left a remnant force there? Um, could, you know, and we basically, that is an argument that's out there right now, 2,500 troops were keeping the Taliban at bay. And then other people say, no, actually there was an agreement that they wouldn't attack American forces. And if we recommitted to staying, they may have, you know, so should we have left? Go ahead, Jill. There are a couple problems with the idea that, uh, Afghanistan without US and partner troops is particularly vulnerable. The first is that Al Qaeda Central was not in Afghanistan because of anything that had to do with Afghanistan. The United States wasn't in Afghanistan for anything that had to do with Afghanistan. It's like the Vietnam War. The country itself was irrelevant to the interests of the great powers involved. In Afghanistan, um, 100,000 troops, US plus the other uh, countries supporting the US effort, 100,000 plus troops could not reduce the violence significantly. In fact, there's a good argument to be made, and John touched on this, that the more foreign forces you have, the more likely to have resistance. And in fact, it's very clear that things like uh, homemade bombs planted for uh, foreign forces, in fact, are just as likely to explode on Afghan civilians in their uh, herds as they are to actually hit and destroy any foreign element. So having foreign forces in Afghanistan in the first place is highly costly to Afghan civilians. Second, as, um, as the other speakers have also noted, Al Qaeda Central very quickly alienated the Taliban after 9 11. There was uh, terrific unhappiness on the side of the Mullah Omar contingent, and there was very little reason to think after the US response that uh, the largest Taliban element at that time would have accepted Al Qaeda Central into the country again. Another point, and I'll make this my final point. The greatest terrorist threat is chemical or biological, and particularly biological. Uh, radiological is, is very scary, but, not, but potentially not nearly as potent as chem or bio. To develop biological weapons, you need reliable infrastructure. That is one thing we can say with confidence that Afghanistan does not yet have. We can also think about the fact that while Al Qaeda Central was training fighters in Afghanistan 20, 25 years ago, it still needed to do the organizing for the 9 11 plot in Hamburg. So, this, this idea that somehow so called ungoverned spaces, which are not at all ungoverned in fact, are what uh, terrorists targeting the United States need to do their dirty work is, I think, unfounded. Thanks, Jill. Um, Audrey or John, do you want to chime in? No, you should ask another question, Monica. Okay, uh, thanks. So uh, let's turn to sort of the regional balance of power. I think, Audrey, you, you've been talking about it. So, and so one, you know, I'm just going to combine a couple of questions, but, you know, what are the regional repercussions and how should the United States think about that? John, you talked about Maybe it's not so great, especially with China um, sitting there. Um, but you know, we have India as a partner sitting there, and it might be quite nervous actually now that the United States president isn't there and uh, emboldening uh, and uh, perhaps empowering Pakistan. So, what are sort of the regional implications uh, and U.S. national security interests moving forward here? Who are you? Who are you? Who do you want to talk? Or Audrey or you? So Audrey, Audrey, you're on mute. Well, if you'd like to go first, I'll go second, whichever. Yeah, okay, I'll say a few words. Uh, as I made clear in my comments, I think the consequences for the United States are a net positive. I don't think that we're hurt at all by getting out of a losing war where we're expending precious resources. Uh, and now we're free to focus more on China. So it's a net positive from our point of view. I think the Chinese actually have mixed emotions about us leaving Afghanistan because they're worried, as are the Russians and as are the Iranians, that uh, Afghanistan is going to become a base for terrorist groups that can attack into China or attack into Russia or attack into Iran. Uh, 
Uh, I think we have this very interesting situation where the Americans, the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians all have a deep-seated interest in making sure that the Taliban does not allow terrorist groups to operate on its soil. But uh, if that happens, uh, that's not a problem of ours. And if it causes trouble for the Chinese, uh, so be it. Uh, and uh, so I don't see this having a meaningful impact on, on the regional balance of power uh, at all. Mm -hmm. Well, just to pick up there, yes, I don't I don't disagree with the word you've said, John, but uh, I would just say that that's why I've been arguing for a neutralization agreement or a neutrality <laughs> agreement for many years, because there is an enormous intersection of great power interests in making sure that Afghanistan is independent and stable. I mean, if you, you can go from Iran, which is very worried about Shiite minorities, uh, you've got the Pakistanis who have long intervened in um, Afghanistan, and now they're likely to get blowback, particularly from the Pakistani Taliban. And oh, by the way, we're not at all sure that the Afghan Taliban is going to be able to hold on to its members when it's governing in such a way that it's trying to gather international resources. And that will be very unpopular with many of those who engaged in jihad and wanted to martyr themselves uh, within their ranks. Then you've got China that is very closely aligned with uh, Pakistan economically and also wants to have a stable region because they've got their great vulnerability of the Uyghurs in Western China. Uh, you've got Central Asia, which has many ties with the region and Russia, of course. I mean, <laughs> we all know about the invasion of Afghanistan by Russia. Russia's interests in Afghanistan are very obvious and clear and historically strong. So let's see, what have I left out? India, India actually has lost um, probably of all the regional powers um, ha has probably lost the most because they can no longer maintain any kind of a presence within Afghanistan. Um, and they had reason to maintain that presence partly to have um, more stability, but that caused enormous paranoia on the part of the Pakistanis. So I don't necessarily think that it's only a question of whether the Taliban will allow terrorist attacks. It's also a question of whether the Taliban will itself be able to govern in such a way that will keep that country stable and will not cause um, uh, you know, uh, other types of violence that other powers will then intervene in. Mm -hmm. That's great. So Audrey, I'm gonna stay with you a little bit. Um, and then Jill, if you wanna come in, uh, but you're you know, sort of the terrorism expert and been studying it for decades. Um, so you know, your, your notion of this neutrality idea, this neutrality pact, people like it, <laughs> it seems from the comments. Um, but one person's raising a very, you know, and it, it sort of comes out of that comment that you just made, that there seemed to be some unification of ideas about getting the occupation over among Afghans, at least among Afghans who support the Taliban, and we know they do have some support. Um, but what do we do about this sort of divisions within the Islamic jihadist community um, and get them to come along um, to support this idea of a neutrality pact? Yeah, that is always the most difficult aspect because you've got so many factions within Afghanistan, but many of those factions do want outside powers to stay out. So they also have intersecting interests. You know, they, they may wish to compete with each other, but they don't necessarily want to be crushed by an external power coming in. So Afghanistan, to the extent that it is one nation, which is uh, you know, it's it's not a traditional nation state. It's 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 a group of different tribal regions that has not really fit most models over the over the centuries. But to the extent that it does want to have some kind of secure borders against external intervention, there can be an, an intersection of interest between the tribes and the various factions within Afghanistan. But I'm not going to try to sugarcoat it. It's it's difficult. Mm -hmm. I I will only point to the fact that. Um, Afghan leaders themselves have been very interested in this model. Mm -hmm. And I should say that was from um, M. Matha Swaran. I apologize if I mispronounced your name. So another question, this is sort of for Jill and it's about the, the defense establishment itself and who should be doing this from Edward Brown. So it's a long question, but it's a good one. You know, Much of the role of security assistance was shifted from the Department of State to the Department of Defense. And actually we can even talk about the um, bringing in the CIA uh, in order to conduct counterinsurgency and counterterrorism efforts. Should this, the US sustain the practice of employing military capacity to conduct security assistance? Should the US resign reassign primary responsibility exclusive to the Department of State, you know, and we all know that its budget is only 5% of the Department of Defense. 
um, or should the U.S. develop a separate capacity for this type of civil military effort? And I don't, I know John's operation, like get out of the business, but Jill, what's your response to that question by Edward Brown? I think it's probably closer to John's than to many other members of the blob, although I can't claim membership in the blob, I don't think. These types of state building exercises, including something as innocuous as arming and training in other military as in Nigeria, for example, these efforts on the part of the United States cannot make domestic political concerns within the target state disappear. A country that does not need or that does not want to develop a professional military is not going to develop a, prof a professional military, no matter how much money the United States gives it, or no matter how hard the United States presses. The United States has limited leverage when it steps into one of these relationships with a smaller, weaker partner. It actually turns out to be the smaller, weaker state that has leverage over the United States because it's the United States that has committed itself to the government survival, whether with a full blast occupation or with uh, at the less invasive end arming and training, the United States is very unlikely to be going anywhere, which is why the Biden withdrawal from Afghanistan is so remarkable and so welcome. A uh, repressive government wants a repressive military for domestic security. It wants a coup-proof military, which can also mean evading efforts to professionalize it. And if it professionalized its military, the fundamental problem is that that would cut off an important source of nepotism and preferment within the elites in that country. Governing elites in a repressive state don't do what they do because they don't understand the right way to do things. They do the things they do because it's what they need to do to keep their wealth and power. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Can, I, can I say a word on this subject? Sure, of course, John. Uh, I think that there's no way in a situation like Afghanistan that the US military, and here we're mainly talking about the US Army, can avoid getting deeply involved. First of all, you need the army to train the Afghan army. Second, you need the army to fight battles against the Taliban and other forms of resistance in the country because the Afghani army itself, which you're training up, is not capable of doing that. And the problem is that that slowly, that mission that the army has slowly morphs into nation building. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that the army is front and center in the nation building process. Now you and I, Monica, are both army veterans, right? We both served in the US army. And we both know that armies are really good at breaking things, winning big wars involving lots of firepower and so forth and so on but you do not want to use the US Army for nation building because it's not constituted for nation building. The people who are at the heart of that institution are just not good at doing that kind of enterprise. So what happens in these situations, and again, we saw the same thing in Vietnam, is that the Army becomes the central American player on the ground. And uh, if you're counting on the US Army to do nation building in a really dicey situation, uh, you're cruising for a bruising, as we used to say when I was a kid. Audrey, if you can come in. Oh, Jill, we're gonna go to Audrey first and then Jill will go to you. Just a brief PS to what John was just talking about. And also I see something in the comments that uh, or the questions that I'd like to refer to. Greg Olson has made a comment that really triggers some experiences that I've had. Um, and oh, by the way, it's not just the army, it's also uh, our buddies in the Marines, uh, even though it's a much smaller force. There was a period of time fairly early on in the occupation. Um, I think it, I, I'm guessing about the years, I think it was about 2008, but I'm not sure, where I remember my friends in the military arguing with each other about exactly what type of an army they should help build or strengthen within Afghanistan. and. We made a big mistake in trying to build an army that looked a lot like the United States Army, using forward operating bases, 
using American weapons instead of AK-47s that they were much more familiar with as we had in prior situations and many other powers have, by the way. Um, you know, we, we, we tried to duplicate this kind of army set of forces, you know, that would require the kind of air support that the United States has and Afghanistan is just never going to have that. So it wasn't just that we were, you know, building those forces and getting sucked into nation building. It was also a question of what kind of forces, what kind of training were you engaged in? I think had we used the kind of training that naturally suited the terrain, the culture, the tribal structure, we could well have gotten out much earlier, 10 or 15 years ago. Thanks, Audrey. Jill? Three very quick points that dig down a little bit into John and Audrey's comments. First of all, uh, you can't build an effective professional military without the institutions of a state. And it is extremely difficult for outsiders to build the state. Uh, you might say it's impossible. Second quick point, um, the alignment of interest between the intervening great power supporting the government and the threatened government itself is very likely very small. The alignment of interest includes keeping that government in power and not a whole lot else because reforms are not in the interests of elites within the counterinsurgent state. Third point, I don't think this is a technical problem, a technological problem of how to train the ANA to fight. It's a more fundamental problem than that. Um, it's a problem of whether or not your military wants to fight for the things you want it to fight for. The ANA had very little interest down to its smallest elements in fighting for what the United States and its partners wanted it to fight for. Thanks, Jill. So Audrey, I think this one's directed at you, although the others are welcome to chime in. It's the one about the evidence of the Taliban al-Qaeda relationship. And you know, we know that the Taliban, this is why we got there in the first place after September 11, and the Taliban have now committed uh, to saying we are not going to allow, you know, for terrorist activities to be fomented from their land. But what is, in your opinion, this is from Stuart Kaufman, uh, what is the evidence of that relationship now? And what makes you think that the relationship is now weak? Yeah, I don't think it's weak. I, I don't think there is any evidence that it's weak. Um, I, I don't think that that's where we should put our focus. I think it's more that the Taliban government, to the extent that they're going to have any kind of success in staying power, has it in its interest now not to allow an attack to be projected from Afghan territory. If you're talking about where attacks are going to be projected from against the United States, I think it's far more likely to be from a place like um, probably Yemen, uh, perhaps um, Somalia, uh, you know, there are a number of other parts of the world that I think are far more likely to be able to host, particularly Yemen, to be able to host training camps and be dangerous to the United States than the territory of Afghanistan is. That's quite a separate question from what is the relationship between the Taliban and Afghanistan. We really can't keep replaying the, the movie as it happened in the 1990s. I think the world is very different now, and particularly, you know, the positions where Al Qaeda is strong are, are very, very different. Mm -hmm. John and Jill, any commentary there? No? Okay. No. Um, so, go ahead, John. No, I, I thought Audrey's point was right on the money. Yeah, no, I agree. But years later, these are going to, well, now we have ISIS K, you know. Um, all right. So um, there's a question from Vasily Klementov. Um, and he's wondering the extent to which the U.S. can or should cooperate with regional powers to stabilize Afghanistan or just simply disengage from the region. Um, you know, do we have national interests there helping to stabilize the country or should we just absolutely just sort of leave? Um, John, do you want to start? I'll just say very quickly, I think we addressed this before, mainly me and Audrey, and I think we agreed we did have a vested interest in working with other countries to create a stable and to use Audrey's rhetoric, neutral Afghanistan. The last thing we want is to cause all sorts of problems there uh, and uh, allow the uh, Al Qaeda or any other terrorist group to find a place to operate because uh, Afghanistan is the wild west. Mm -hmm. So can I follow up, John, because earlier there was a question about Afghanistan and why the United States has been so light, light handed with Afghanistan. I mean, is it time to sort of put more pressure on Afghanistan, I'm sorry, not Afghanistan, Pakistan, right, um, for to be a better citizen, 
right? And not allow for these terrorist operations to be operating in, in different parts of the country? Or is it the case that Pakistan doesn't have the capacity to control them? It's not a matter of intention, it's a matter of capability. My sense is if the United States had the leverage, they would have used it. And the United States did not have the leverage. Uh, you know, we have limited influence on Pakistan. That's been true on all sorts of fronts, including the nuclear front. Uh, and I would imagine going forward as, you know, the, the Cold War between the United States and China heats up and you have a situation where we're basically aligned with India and China's aligned with Pakistan, that it'll be even more difficult to get cooperation out of Pakistan. But the United States had a profound interest in getting Pakistan to cooperate with us uh, with regard to the Taliban. And by the way, with regard to finding Osama bin Laden, uh, but if my memory is correct, uh, we didn't get much cooperation on either of those issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jill? I think once again, this is a great example of how much domestic politics within the other state matter. The United States often says, oh, Pakistan should have X and Y as very important interests. But in fact, the Pakistani Pakistanis see it very differently. They have a profound belief in the de defensive and offensive importance of these militias that it is at least in contact with inside and outside the country, if not running. And as John says, the United States simply has no leverage to make Pakistan think its interests are other than they what it thinks they are now. Mm -hmm. Great. I would only add the point that Pakistan has always seen Afghanistan as its defense in depth. And so their primary enemy in their view has always been India. And they have always been um, intervening and, and sort of being involved in various different ways in Afghanistan. And it, it, you know now they've got their wish, but unfortunately the Pakistanis are going to have blowback. And, and the other thing is that geographically, remember that we needed the Pakistanis in order to use the Khyber Pass to be able to get through uh, Peshawar and then to be able to bring supplies in through Pakistan, particularly when we couldn't bring them in from the North. So you know, there was a geopolitical interest here too. But Pakistan is a nuclear country. So the degree to which we have leverage, I agree with John there, is, is um, not that great. Mm -hmm. And I should say that question came from Pajatka Gupta. So, you know, we have two minutes left. I'm just wondering if any, you know, either any of you would like to sort of last comments about sort of US national security policy that we didn't cover um, and, and how we can think about sort of not getting to, into this kind of morass again in the future. Uh, so I think I'll, we'll go in reverse order of uh, how we started, reverse alphabetical order. So John, um, any last comments about how we as scholars, as academics, but with an interest in informing policy should be thinking about this um, uh, in, in any way moving forward? Well, not to overdo the Vietnam analogy, but I think as was the case with Vietnam, uh, we will not get involved in another one of these enterprises for a long, long time. Uh, I think we've been badly burned in both Afghanistan and in Iraq. And the principal message is don't go into these places. At the same time, given the change that's taken place in the distribution of power in the world, where you have the rise of China and you have this intense US China competition heating up in East Asia. I think the focus is going to be there. And I think in a very important way, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq are gonna be left in the rear view mirror. And that complements my earlier point that we just don't want to get involved in another disastrous situation like this again, for all the obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Thanks, John. Jill? Yeah, thank you for uh, letting us give one last thought. I think the two things that the United States security establishment needs to focus on going forward is first, a greater attempt to recognize the agency of these smaller and weaker states with which it deals. And second, and as a part of that, the need to recognize the domestic political interests that these states are dealing with and that are probably far more important than what the United States is thinking about. Just to go back to Vietnam for a minute, for the North Vietnamese, the United States was a speed bump in the way of reuniting Vietnam. 
The United States didn't see itself that way, but that's certainly how the North Vietnamese did. And then um, finally, in the geopolitical terms, I am pretty sure that China and Russia are perfectly happy to have the United States bleed in these so-called small wars that are small only to the United States. Thanks, Jill. Uh, I'll just make two quick points. The first one's on counterterrorism policy. And um, I believe that we have to be able to do two things at one time. I think that it is very important that we transfer attention toward great power rivalries, but I also believe that we have to have good CT policy. No time to talk about that now, but I have an article coming out in survival early part of next month that will explain that. Second um, is diplomacy. I very strongly believe that our ability to engage, the United States' ability to engage in serious diplomacy is very is tremendously hobbled right now, just at the time when we need diplomacy more than ever. And you know, the Biden administration is making uh, initiatives in uh, the diplomatic area, but they don't have their team filled out. We don't have confirmations of ambassadors in NATO, Australia, India, China, Germany, France, the UK, anyway, we could go on. The Quad, none of the four countries in the Quad where we're having meetings next week has an American ambassador. We don't have people in place. So how is it that we're going to engage in serious diplomacy as we desperately need when we don't have a strong State Department? I'm very concerned about that and would leave the audience with, with that point. Okay, thank you. So, you know, as the chair of IISS, I, I'd like to thank the panel for allowing us to showcase the expertise that we have within the section. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is the first panel of three. The other panels are going to include a uh, discussion of Afghanistan, its stability, um, and a variety of voices from Afghanistan and also from the region to discuss the regional balance of power more. Uh, so thank you, John. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Audrey. Uh, this was a terrific panel, and I'm honored to have been the moderator. Have a good evening and thank you to the attendees uh, for coming.